agriculture and the agri-food sector is still very relevant for um, employment creation in Africa. And with the growing population, especially a young population, we need more jobs. And I think the um, vast majority of um, the jobs in agriculture, but also in general, are in the informal sector. So I think also for methodology reasons, for monitoring um, employment effects, I think this is highly relevant to our rural development sector. Um, looking at the potentials, I think at the moment still around two-thirds of all the jobs are in the food economy, 50% um, on average on farming. And um, according to OECD for West Africa, but I think also in other regions we find a similar picture, um, the agri-food um, sector is still growing. So there, for example, in West Africa, 32 million jobs are expected to be created in the next 10 years until 2025. And as a general trend, there is a decrease in farming in the relative share, but still um, the sector is growing in absolute numbers. So this will be highly relevant, but the general trend is also due to mechanization, profitization, the employment shares in farming will decrease, but still the, the sector as, as a whole will be the uh, most relevant sector for employment creation. Um, also, this is the reason why this is very high on the political agenda, both in BMZ and the German Development Corporation, but also on international level uh, with the G20 and the G20 initiative on um, EU and African Union partnerships, uh, African Development Bank, IFAD. I think all of those have this topic highly on their um, political agenda. And I think so far we don't have the topic um, integrated into our portfolio very strategically. Nevertheless, it's not really new. And also we do value chain development, we do economic promotion, also employment promotion since a long time, but maybe not with a very strategic focus. And I think this is what is new and this is also why um, the sector project was, was created. So just to give you a very short overview, we have like three working areas, one on political processes, national and international. Um, the main second working area on concept development and monitoring of employment effects. And the third one on networking, learning and mainstreaming into the um, portfolio. And I think the, here we also have the direct link to the uh, sector network. Um, the main fo regional focus is on Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, but I think also experiences from other continents are highly relevant. And we have a five-year term, which is a little bit uh, exceptional, and are financed out of the CEO budget. Um, but I think usually it's a very classical setup of, of a sector project. And just some um, upcoming activities or current activities, I think um, the integration of the employment topic in the further development of the SEVO, but also the portfolio in general, I think is one of the most important tasks. And of course, here we closely work together also with uh, FMB. Um, I think the upcoming results data, Christoph will share a few words on that. And we are also working on a methodology for monitoring employment impacts at the moment with the RBE. And I think some of you also have heard about it. And there will be like a field testing of this methodology is upcoming in one of two countries now in September, October. And I think some entry points with the SNRD. Um, I think the community of practice, the EDA platform um, is um, something we would like to also together with you um, to develop and fill with uh, with content with the links to both working groups and value chains and policy processes. So I think this is something um, upcoming and also like doing a first stock taking on the current approaches both at policy and project level uh, with SNRD and of course our webinar series now where we which is start today and I think some topics potential topics for the upcoming sessions could be on decent work and living income, for example, on value for money, cost for jobs. Uh, I think this is a hot topic and also mechanization and yeah, I think um, the general concepts and lessons learned to know what works in employment creation. So, but these are just some ideas and I think we are also looking uh, very much forward to your interests and your inputs. And yeah, I think if you have any ideas, please don't hesitate to contact us. Okay, thank you very much, Frank, for this brief introduction. So now we have time for you, Christoph, for your um, input.
in discussions among a set of uh, colleagues uh, over the past few months, we were of the opinion that agriculture and rural development plays a significant role in uh, um, creating jobs uh, in our partner countries. And um, when the uh, um, results data um, collection came up that is currently running, we were very much arguing uh, to make sure that uh, indeed um, our projects in the context of agriculture and rural development have an opportunity to present and uh, account for the results uh, that are achieved there. And that's why I would like to uh, encourage uh, you and uh, everyone in our um, uh, um, structure, um, in our projects, to make sure that actually we are going to report the employment data um, as much as possible so that we really represent what we are achieving in agriculture and rural development. To this effect, uh, we have now, uh, um, and you can see um, under um, indicator one, you see uh, um, employment. And uh, um, we have four sub indicators there. The first one is actually on new jobs. The second one is on additional employment. And the additional employment is very much geared as well towards agriculture and rural development because we have and uh, we have seen um, significant uh, impact here in reduced underemployment, in increased uh, um, employment opportunities. And I would really like to encourage everyone to, to uh, either, um, if you have measured data, to enter the measured data, but if you uh, have not measured data, then to estimate uh, impact um, and report it under the uh, indicator 1.2. And then we have uh, the indicator on working conditions and then uh, on income. Income is a classical indicator and uh, we perceive uh, and we think that this one will be anyone uh, an indicator that is uh, common. Now, um, the other one is the rural development food security indicators and I think that is uh, one that uh, um, most of our projects will report anyway. The, uh, um, the survey is open until 15th of September and if you have any questions or so, always feel free to contact us and please uh, um, um, yeah, consider this uh, survey and uh, um, enter data under employment. Now we have your presentation, Ahmed. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will be, uh, I'm very happy to be uh, uh, in, in this webinar today, basically representing uh, Kimone Consultant, which is a regional consultancy firm, and Cleantech Arabia. I'm one of the co founders of this nonprofit foundation. Uh, both um, have experience in the topic. And uh, basically, for, uh, for, both, uh, for both, I will represent. Uh, our view of uh, youth entrepreneurship in the context of development. And just to give you an idea about the numbers I will be uh, using and the experience I'm referring to, uh, this is about uh, a pool of about 190 entrepreneurs. Uh, 110 of them are currently operating. And uh, they, they, we have been tracking them carefully for the last five years. Uh, they, they, they are now, some of them are market leaders. So collectively in 2017, uh, they contributed to the Egypt GDP by 1.2 billion, which is about 0.03% of the country's GDP. The important part is that they have also expanded forward and backward linkages uh, to about 12 or 15 countries uh, between uh, Europe, Africa, and uh, parts of the Middle East. Okay, so there are a couple of uh, ground principles that I would like to share with you so we can be uh, on the same page. These are related to the definition of entrepreneurship and the use of entrepreneurship in development. Unfortunately, in the public mind, the entrepreneurs now have an image of a young person who wants to create a world-changing business and quickly reach 1 billion uh, USD of revenue and, 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 and can sell very quickly to uh, VCs. And this is usually referred to as the unicorn. And this is, I would like to refer to it as the Silicon Valley investor gene. Um, the, the important part here is that the actual definition of entrepreneurship uh, that I'd like to focus on is, is way more simple. It is someone who sees an opportunity and, create, and can create value and is willing to take risks to capitalize on this opportunity. I like to also say 
without necessarily relying on big capital. Uh, the, the, the strength is not in the size of the investment they put in, it's in the idea and the innovation. And in that sense, a startup is not uh, a very attractive uh, social network company. It is simply a young company uh, that can do the above. Uh, also, sometimes in Sutia for entrepreneurship makes a mistake that they try to pose it as a magical solution for developing economy. I, I do not believe so. I believe it can, it can be an important tool in, in the sustainable development of markets. However, it has to remain one tool that can succeed only in certain aspects. We need other tools such as uh, skills development, labor market development, education, uh, technology transfer. So it is just one tool. This one tool, which, which we can refer to as an entrepreneurship for development, is unique in some, in some sense. First of all, when we talk about entrepreneurship in development, then the entrepreneur, they become the means to an end. The objective is not just the startup, but actually what this startup can do for the macro economy. Entrepreneurship, when deployed in the right way, it can truly create sustainable jobs. It can actually deliver a lot of products and services that improve the life quality of citizens. It can valorize the nation resources and also help preserve uh, the environment. It's very important to realize that when we delve in, into entrepreneurship for development, uh, we also care very much about the macro impact of this company as much as we care that the investor has high returns. So in that sense, we are not only focusing on the company, but I would say the more important is the indirect impact it has on the market and community. So why, why then entrepreneurship can be so successful in these cases and in, in achieving these objectives? Well, at least from what I have seen, the large firms, particularly in developing economies, uh, they prefer to deploy products and, rel and, and rely on uh, existing uh, markets where uh, the numbers can be crunched uh, in a good way, uh, where actually uh, the business case is clear and the market is stable. In many cases, it becomes too risky for them to actually uh, enter in turbulent situations or even develop and spend a lot of time develop local solutions that fit a certain local context. In that case, they are very good in leveraging what already exists rather than creating uh, impactful changes to the market as a whole. Yet, they have uh, an important role to play. However, on the other side, startups, from what I have seen, can be very good in the four bullets you see, spearheading new markets. This is why, because they are flexible and they can be very close to their client, even in a local context. They can also catalyze existing markets because they are usually faster in deploying the innovation. They can correct market failures and fill gaps in the value chain because they can tune the solution to the local context. They also typically, since they are smaller and have less overhead and fast changing, they can operate better and absorb higher risk. Just to give you an example, this is very quickly three examples of cases where startups spearheaded uh, markets. So this is bioenergy from Egypt. This was the first company working in alternative fuels from biomass, from agriculture waste to cement companies. They created a very interesting model where they can have a mobile platform for the waste collection and preparation. And they do this with strong partnerships with collectors. So they do not set up a fixed collection facility or anything. Uh, when they started for two or three years, most of the major cement companies did not believe that this is possible. Now what they have done is that together with another two startups, they are leading the market. And five years after this, now we see oh, many of the big players coming to establish their major investments in the sector. To the right, you have this uh, dry tomatoes uh, brand in Egypt. It comes from Luxor, the south of Egypt. It's usually uh, the interesting part is Egyptians were not very used to eating dry tomatoes. Dry tomato. And a couple of companies before tried to import the product, but it didn't go so well. But this company, since it is small and it's very close to uh, the communities and the clients, it was able to adapt the taste. Uh, they realized, for example, 
uh, that there is certain type of tomatoes that Egyptians would prefer in this product. They realize that you can, it is better to use the, for the local flavor, uh, sun, uh, sunflower oil rather than other type of oil. And they managed to, let's say, lock their product to the client need. And now it started to open the whole market of sun-dried tomatoes. They also discovered that Egyptians would still like to believe that this tomato came from Italy, so they picked an Italian name here. Um, Ersic is very interesting also. Ersic um, managed to realize that there is a very thin niche in Egypt TV photovoltaic market. Uh, this niche is actually... Uh, it, it, it is the niche that wants very high quality uh, panels, let's say. These high quality panels are basically uh, the, the, the ones that can operate in a very rugged condition. They are very reliable. They are also very expensive. Most of the big companies did not realize this market segment. This was the market segment of mining uh, companies and uh, oil companies that have major uh, drilling rigs and drilling sites away from the grid. They, they, they started uh, taking a lot of risk by importing a large numbers of a very high quality uh, German brand of TV panels. And they created a very nice business model where they were able to unlock this market segment. The interesting part is that within two years, they created a very good partnership with the German company. And they have taken this product to uh, other two company, uh, countries, Egypt, Kuwait, and Ethiopia. And they also managed to create a, a, a strong partnership with other uh, technology providers in Greece. So somehow this high risk taking startup managed to create these very strong partnerships. We believe they provide about 10% of Egypt TV market through this partnership. And that how, how, how can we leverage entrepreneurs in, in the development uh, context to create this high impact and unlock markets, et cetera? I think the simple answer is in design. Uh, we, we, we need to have a very good understanding of the market and value chain and make a conscious decision about where the resources sh should be allocated and which firms to help. We face three, three situations, and these are half the story to success. One is that when we are trying to enter, open a new market. In that case, I believe we need to do, to do a very careful mapping of market opportunities. In another case, when we are trying to develop a value chain, to be value chain centered, in that case, we need to understand two cases. One, the gaps in the value chain, where the startups can come in and unlock value for the whole chain, and also uh, services and products and byproducts that come to the side of the value chain. And finally, we need to maintain a cluster concept in our mind that the startups that are supported are interconnected. This usually le leads to a very high success rate and cost-effective implementation. This is an example of an exercise on business opportunity mapping that precedes uh, an implementation program. You would see on the top right corner a very different business opportunities that are compared according to various indicators. These indicators try to pick which opportunities uh, can enter the new markets, which markets are not congested, and offer uh, some easier competition for startups, which opportunities also offer both high success rate financially and high social impact, uh, which we look for, but also to, let's say, um, stay away from opportunities where there are legal barriers or regulatory challenges. Uh, this is an example of how you could pick an opportunity. Uh, you would see this card that identifies the opportunities, basic financial data. We have examples of these opportunities opening new markets like in Egypt, uh, this company that does uh, fried banana chips, which was very uncommon in Egypt. It can also create substitutes to sugar, for example, one company in Egypt from dates. The next slide discusses when we deploy entrepreneurship to fill a, a gap in the value chain. If we have an understanding of the value chain and we can find a gap and insert innovation in it, Sometimes the impact is much bigger than the impact on the company itself. It's an impact on its forward and backward linkages. This is an example of a value chain that, uh, again, in Egypt that was identified uh, through some research with the IHE. It was in the mounting structure of PV panels. 
this identification of gaps and focusing of entrepreneurship programs around it led to uh, three Egyptian companies creating the first three uh, high-quality mounting structures for TV systems. And in the span of two years, about 70% of this uh, mounting structures were being manufactured in Egypt after being imported. That's another example where, where innovation can improve value chain. You will see a value chain of uh, data production in Egypt. And this is, I like to call uh, what you see horizontally is the, the main thrust of the value chain. Entrepreneurs can play around the value chain. They can provide it with services, but they can also take waste, for example, from it to actually be able to, uh, I would say, increase the effectiveness of the chain. This is an example of a sugarcane value chain in Egypt, where you see the arrows pointing to the main thrust of the value chain, uh, sugarcane farmers, then sugar uh, processing, then sugar refinery. The mapping identified that you can work around this value chain by, in the circle to the right bottom, use the waste to alternative fuel. To the left, you see the circle where you use the waste from farming into animal feed and the circle in the middle where you use the waste from the factory into uh, compost. There were, was a program in Luxor in Egypt in 2014 that managed to create one startup that works on the sugar mat to compost and three startups working on the animal feed. And in the span of four years, the three startups working in the animal feed, they triggered another 12 startups focusing on different uh, market segments. Then these trigger two equipment producers and they trigger 29 collectors. They have effectively linked two value chains together. The thing we see that when you, when you plug someone in, in this market, something impactful happens. What do we look for when we work in this, in this type of approach and how we deploy entrepreneurship? First of all, there is a time factor. Here you see this is the average revenue of the companies, the, the companies I'm basing the stats on, you see something interesting happening usually after the second year towards the third year. So we need some time. The other part, we need to look at the quality of jobs created, not just the number. Are they sustainable? Which type of skills they address? We need to also analyze carefully the impact on the forward and the backward linkage of the startup to ensure that it is really positive on the value chain. We have to keep track of new markets spearheaded and we also have to keep track of indirect startups or companies that are triggered by these entrepreneurs. And finally, the value going to the customer. Is this animal feed more cost effective? Actually, what we have seen in this region of Egypt with the flourishing of this agri-waste to animal feed, that the, the cost of animal feed has dropped by about 15%, for example. The quick takeaway is that entrepreneurship for development is different from just entrepreneurship. It can be an effective tool to sustainable development of markets, as well as make a lot of profit for investors and firms. Startups, in that sense, we look at them in what they can do in spearheading, catalyzing markets, filling value chain gaps, uh, branching these value chains to increase its effectiveness. We need to be sector specific and have a very clear view about a planned intervention. We need to uh, embed this view in our support programs. So the support program could start by a business opportunity mapping or a careful value chain analysis. Uh, and we can also think of how to link these startups and also provide them with the tools to be able to analyze the value chains and determine business opportunities um, in, in, a, in, a, in a very simple uh, way that while these uh, seems to be an extra effort for the implementer of, of the program. And sometimes they are seen that they will delay the delivery. What they do is that they dramatically increase the success rate of startups. Uh, with these techniques, we are able to reach 40 and 50% success rate. And in that sense, it's a good investment to look at startups in this way. Thank, Thank you very much. It. Thank you. We had two questions that I would like to answer now. There was one question that yep. was to you exactly, Ahmed, and it was the question, um, how can we reach the scale of your um, what you just presented at affordable costs, and what is the role of the government in this? Actually, the costs are cut down dramatically when you are sector-specific. So, for example, let's say in, in Tunisia, uh, the focus of, is on... Um, agri, uh, agri businesses, so we are in a certain sector, we are focusing even on certain value chains that are 
flourishing in certain regions. And in that case, uh, the cost of these studies is divided upon all the firms you support. Actually, what happens is the cost effectiveness also increases because selection becomes easier. Uh, the other part is that uh, the support becomes focused around these challenges uh, in the value chain. So, so to give you an example, if, if I know that the, 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 the key market is high-end compost, and I know that we cannot produce it in a certain region because of absence of know-how, then my pro pro program can focus a lot on something like this. So I would say that this understanding of the value chain gives you a better view of how to to, uh, to, 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 to increase the success rate. So government, from my point of view, is that government uh, slowly have to uh, embrace these type of studies and promote them. Uh, the one governorate we worked in in Egypt started actually to do these type of studies and post them on their website as investment opportunities to attract uh, different capital. There was a question, Ahmed. Which methods and tools did you use to map your value chains in your value chain analysis? And the second part of this question is how do you measure the impact of your success? So I think we, we typically look at uh, what I say business uh, indicators, business as usual. Uh, basically, we look at revenue and growth of revenue for the companies. And then we look at employment and type of employment. So these, I would say, the, and then we look at also the growth of capital for the investor. So let's say I injected a million in this company. In five years, now it is doing this much revenue. Uh, these, I would say, the typical business indicators. For jobs, we look at type of jobs. So are they for technical workers, semi skilled labor, university graduates? And then we look what I would say as the market or the value chain indicators. We look at Uh, what forward and backward linkages we have created? Am I making my clients more sustainable? Am I paying my supplier more money? So, for example, in this agri-waste in sugarcane, uh, we look at, okay, now this company is buying waste from to, to, uh, five, six new collectors. So they have created something sustainable for this supplier. They are selling this, this much uh, cheaper animal waste, uh, animal feed, so they are helping their clients. So we look at the forward-backward linkage, and we try to track spearheaded markets if someone opened a new market. Okay, thanks. Please go ahead. Okay. Start with your presentation, Matthias. I work in the bilateral program, uh, bilateral agricultural program in Tunisia, and we've started uh, since last year in November, approximately, uh, with a new program uh, that we called Agripreneur and is um, about the promotion of young agripreneurs in Tunisia. And as you can guess, agripreneurs, the mix of uh, um, entrepreneur and uh, agricultural expert or ag agricultural uh, technician. Yeah. First of all, I want to um, just specify that there's a difference between youth entrepreneurship promotion and the professionalization of uh, smallholder farmers. As this, the latter is what we mostly do, let's say, in, uh, in our um, agricultural programs. And uh, the specificity, specificity of youth entrepreneurship um, explains itself as we don't have active farmers that we're working with and work on FBS or other things, but it's spe specifically also for people that are probably not from the agricultural sector but want to do something in the agri agricultural sector or are from the agricultural sector but haven't really um, started their own enterprise yet. Um, in Tunisia, and this is, I think, a ve valid for other sub-Saharan countries as well, is that we have a high unemployment rate and that the agri-sector itself um, is especially economically unattractive uh, for the youth um, and also limited by the access to capital and assets, often also for women. And uh, as I would call, old farms is an issue that the techniques, but also the, the owners of these farms uh, are often more than 35 years old. Um, also a lack of in initiative and own ideas, the inside the box thinking is a big uh, limitation that we observed uh, with the groups we're working with. Um, and also um, the thinking of classical agriculture, what I call classical in the rest of the presentation is just pure soil-based production agriculture 
Um, and this is something that where we observed a lack of inspiration on thinking on other links uh, of the value chain. And this is something that Ahmed is going to present how um, a better analysis of the value chain and not in the pure, simple main five segments, but also in all the other links and gaps that might exist in the links open up not five possibilities or opportunities, but maybe 80 opportunities in just one value chain. And of course, that we also observe in other countries is the absence of a Kazi, absence of a, a great, strong, mostly private uh, ecosystem that may be able to de deliver the adequate services. Um, the niche that we're filling in Tunisia is that all the other development projects we need to, uh, African Development Bank and FAO are not sector specific, mostly apart from the FAO one, and but also always focus exclusively on uni university graduates. And the last thing is that also when we started our program is that we tried to find out what do we have as a from the shelf as a, to offer as GRZ to create jobs. And uh, we mostly saw FPS, which is mostly for professional, professionalizing farm, smallholder farmers. Then we have uh, BUS, Bauernunternehmerschulung, uh, we have CEFE, and all of this with a new concept of uh, selling it or providing it via the business loop. Uh, however, this is uh, all these tools that we have from the shelf uh, were, weren't good enough for us um, as a lacking specific youth uh, focusing and also um, the lacking the idea testing and also the the handcraft of the tool to really create the company or because it's mostly focusing on also existing informal groups or individuals that are already having an, an economic activity and then trying to formalize them. So what we did is that we just uh, tapped into uh, what the Navi, so the um, sustainable um, econ economy uh, development uh, groups have to offer and also the ICT promotion tools. And these are the tools that we thought would be most uh, appropriate, such as business opportunity study, the BOS, ideation, which is helping to find ideas, the lean approach, which is, which is a, a customer oriented approach, the business model canvas which, versus the business plan, which is a simplified way of uh, trying to work on the, on, the, on the business idea. And then the uh, minimum viable product, which is um, the first prototype to try and sell the product and mentoring and coaching, etc. So this is all the tools that we're trying to uh, have a look at. And then we, we tried also with the help of Chimonix to break it down and adapt it to the Tunisian, the rural and the agri-sector, um, which may mostly means simplifying it. And so what we also tried to apply is that we needed to inspire more uh, the youth via an attractivity campaign and success stories and especially via Facebook and a caravan which we did in all the regions in Tunisia and then also the ones that signed up um, went through to through an ideation phase which helped them uh, find ideas also by, by suggesting ideas and also by teaming up and fostering uh, finding uh, people that might want to work together and then the next phase that's going to start soon is the concretization of these ideas, which will uh, be the first test before we actually choose the best ones and the ones we want to continue with. So this is a brief overview, just quickly what we did. We reached over 23,000 youth via the attractivity campaign, and now we just trained 950 participants in the ideation. This is uh, the main results I'm going to present in a minute. And then... Um, we think that we'll have less than 950, 950 business models and then we'll have the call for application and we'll choose the best 300 and then hope that we will have a 250 ready to start by the end of June uh, next year. And what we will also do is that we are collecting a lot of data. That's why um, this is pretty relevant for the RWI, which uh, the sector project is also working with, which is uh, the Research Institute and um, we're going to measure all of the impacts of the different stages since it's a big test. And this, we think, has never been before in the agricultural sector and in this scale. And that's why the RVE was interested. And for us, it's a big learning experience to that. I hope that your sector network of uh, Frank and Julia can, um, um, can capitalize on. So as we said, we did the big campaign and we 
we reached 23,000 people in our target regions. Um, and the result of it was were that we had more than 3,300 people signing up. So despite the agro-pessimism that everyone was talking about, and most of them were under 35, uh, almost half and half, but a bit more males, men, and um, most of them, interestingly enough, even though we were, weren't targeting them, um, were from the, had a university degree, and most of them had already been working before. Then, uh, interestingly enough as well, is that we're not working with the poorest of the poor, so this is also something for the discussion, is that also even with smallholders, I think this is a big um, element that we have to think about, is that not the poorest can really try and take risk in that entrepreneurship, but the most of them that signed up have at least a SMIC, which is the minimum income. And um, interestingly enough, also one-fifth already is already working and just wants to do something on their own. The interesting part is that we wanted to be open to all, um, to everyone, even if no, one wouldn't have an idea. That's why we also uh, implemented the ideation phase. And we had one-fifth that didn't have an idea. We had uh, one-third approximately that already has, had a business plan and was looking for financing. And there were almost 50% that had um, a vague idea but needed support to concretize it. And most of the ideas of those who had an idea um, are actually what I called initially classical ideas, that meaning pure agricultural production, primary production ideas. And only very little had other ideas such as food production and very, very little had ICT ideas. And this was also a purpose, well, the main purpose for us was to support people that didn't have an idea to have an idea so that they would be capable of participating in the call for application. But what it turned out in the end in the ideation that it also helped people that to have and that had an idea to concretize it or even change it because they found out that they weren't inspired enough or hadn't thought it through enough. Quickly, the impact of the ideation, and as I said, it wasn't only helping people to find an idea, but we found out that a lot of people changed their idea because the methodology was so good. Um, and so thanks to the ideation, we have, before we had 5% ICT and now we have 17% uh, of ICT ideas, which we found really interesting. Uh, 3% more service ideas. And also for the repetition um, of the subsectors, of the, the distribution of the subsectors of the ideas, as you saw before, with 61% of pure agricultural ideas, uh, primary production ideas, and now we have only 34%. And this is really something that is uh, real. No, we have only, sorry, this is the orange one here. We have only 23% left after ideation, and most of them switched over to other services or to food production. So Ahmed has talked to you about how little gaps can be identified during the ideation and how this can be filled by young entrepreneurs who are able to take the risk and are dynamic and bring in the expertise that maybe big companies or main actors of the value chain uh, can't do. And this is the example of Nava Akrami from Kerouan, um, who is uh, providing and producing beehive wax. This is um, the one that helps pre-preparing the beehives. And for now, it's also only been imported to Tunisia, but with the big inflation of the dinar, this is becoming more and more interesting. And she comes from a village that um, are big bee experts. And the other example is uh, of Walid Faleh, who, is, uh, who wants to produce uh, sweetwater fish because, of course, Tunisia is a big coast, but mostly has uh, salt uh, water fish, and he wants to um, provide Caruan with uh, fresh water fish. So this is... The main argument also for filling gaps in the value chains, but uh, chains. But this one is the one for uh, maybe opening more markets, and maybe maybe others will fill, will fill it in. And then you have all the other actors of the value chain that might support Walid in this case. And the other thing that we wanted to have initially was to help people find an idea. And now, after before we had 21% without an idea, and now they're only down to 2%. And most interestingly enough, we had the people that were quite advanced, and some of them also changed their idea, but also some of them ended up without an idea after the ideation, which we already uh, suspected that the business plans that are provided here or helped with here 
are not that good. And after that training, people found out that the idea is not actually that good and they will have to start from scratch. And just a quick slide on necessity versus opportunity, which is also a big topic in entrepreneurship. And we thought that due to the high unemployment that most of the participants will be uh, want to be entrepreneurs due to necessity. But we found that uh, mo a lot of them, of course, want to earn more money, which is the third line here, gagner plus d'argent. Um, but um, some of them also, of course, uh, not too many, sorry, um, said that they didn't find another job and that's why they want to create their own uh, company. And we did another split. We have a lot of data and we did another split for those who are already earning a lot, around 1,000 uh, dinars, which is three times the minimum wage. And they actually all did it for the prestige and other reasons, but not for the money, interestingly enough. And this is a high potential for success, but this is also for the debate maybe later. Um, it, that also helps to understand that we might want to target other groups, if it's the unemployed and the poor ones, if we wanted to, differently. The recommendations that we know so far, and it's the big test that we are going on with the next phases until uh, June next year, is that we, the campaign to attract the participants, it's very, very important. Then another thing that we did, and we already saw how valuable it was for trainings, was to make a good business opportunity study and to found, find out what we want to support and what we could recommend and what we think isn't a good idea for the youth that we are um, supporting. Because this is something that I also see in other programs that I worked with is that we don't have um, a thorough understanding of what works and what wouldn't work. And this is really really, really important because we take a big responsibility supporting ideas and the participant or the young entrepreneur really counts on us only like by supporting his or her idea if it's really valuable. Um, I talked about the ideation and the concretization and also we have a big um, system of filtering out all the people that really are not motivated and just come because they probably don't have anything else to do or think that there's something to gain with us, I mean, money-wise. Um, and this is really important that we also just work with the ones and make make them do a lot of work so that we see the real entrepreneurs um, dropping out, basically, or staying in, but the others dropping out. So pre-selection, idea finding, and then testing the idea, then making the competition, then incubation and then the financing. This would be the suggestion that we have or the, um, the hypothesis that we have so far for success. And two other things we're working on basically is to strengthen public partners to manage the private sector, the private service providers, and also the help the private actors to offer attractive and adapted services and formats. And what is still under construction, this is a whole other topic that we could maybe make a webinar on is the whole framework for entrepreneurship and especially financing uh, far f like apart from the main credit, focusing on track credit for creation, which we think is not uh, the best solution. There was a question, is the collection of the off-the-shelf tools and other tools that you mentioned documented and available for others for us? Well, we didn't document it ourselves, but what I know, and I was just parallelly looking in the internet, but I can't find it now. Uh, the, the, the guys that um, did a, um, like standardized the business loop uh, approach, they did an excellent analysis of all the existing tools, the GZ ones and others. Um, so I would uh, suggest for that person to look, to get in touch with the people from FMB who did the, um, we did this, the, the benchmarking and the, and the stock taking for the, for the approaches. It's interesting to get the comparison to Tunisia uh, because there yeah. Matthias presented the figures uh, from 20,000 to 250 something at the end as a target. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned 190, but with how many did you start? And but what kind of target group did you have? No, because I think you, the business models you presented were, were quite big you know, with big, big investments related. Um, okay, so basically, um, basically uh, the, the 190 are the one I would say uh, reached uh, incubation. So this is equivalent to um, 
to in, in Matthias' case to the 250. But uh, we did this over many programs and many years. The bigger pool, which let's say applied for the program, were about 1,200. So we actually selected about let's say 200 from 1,200. And this is just to selection to enter uh, the program. Out of the 190, then 110 are working, and the rest uh, just uh, did not launch the business or launched and failed uh, to continue working. And we only consider a company uh, successful if it operates for more than two years. So I would say we select about 15, 20% of the applicants. They join the program, and about half or 40% of them can continue to be successful companies. And in most cases in the business opportunity mapping, we, we choose to kick away the opportunities that would require large investment. So most of the companies I presented started with limited capital with a minimum viable product and then uh, we grew uh, along the way. To give you a feeling of this size of capital is that in 2017, they created a revenue of 1.2 billion EGP. The total investment that helped create these companies in the beginning were about 20 million EGP. So it, it, it's small compared to the amount of uh, revenue they make. These uh, successful businesses, how many jobs did they create? The interesting part is that uh, directly, directly they created 5,000, about 5,000 uh, full-time sustainable jobs. Mm -hmm. um, they, create, they create some part-time jobs because related to the seasonality, that goes up to about 15,000. But the interesting part is that if you, if you, and this is, I don't try to claim in numbers, but if you look to the fact that they spearheaded market, then the numbers become bigger. So for example, if we take the Luxor case, uh, the three companies we created directly working on waste of sugar cane to animal feed, internally they create about 100 jobs but now they have triggered about another 12 companies and about 29 collectors, and these together create about 12,000 jobs. So I would say the number of jobs in the firms themselves full-time is, is, is high in terms of uh, what you put in investment to create a job, but still the bigger numbers are in the indirect impact. Are there further questions? See a question about the value chain analysis. Okay. Uh, two documents that actually explain the processes we use, uh, but typically we, we rely on a, a mix of tools that, uh, that were developed by uh, Unido, and uh, w the, the, the basis of the technique we do is that it, we do a lot of surveys uh, that actually try to map the existing companies, their revenues, and their interactions together. And based on the interactions, we define the senses of the link, and then we also identify uh, uh, through these interviews and market experts the weak links. So uh, it's a mix of actually survey-based mapping, uh, mapping the interactions and challenges. And I can send two documents where it summarizes how this is done. Okay, thank you very much. I think we learned how important it is to, from Frank to have a look on the creation of new jobs for the youth in Africa. He explained that nicely. Also, um, Frank, uh, um, Christoph just uh, said that we really should measure impact and we should use these new uh, indicators that are introduced now to also show and demonstrate that we actually do create a lot of jobs in GSZ. Um, and then from the presentation of Ahmed and also Matthias, I took away that there are quite a lot of niches in the agricultural sector that we can still fill. There are uh, opportunities for startups to scratch in because they are young, they are uh, flexible and they can yeah, also be very much attached to what the customers actually need. And um, yeah, and finally, um, what I really like is the thing, it's entrepreneurship, especially agri entrepreneurship is not about unicorns, it's nothing magic, it's something we can do with young and engaged farmers and we can use it as a really a successful and easy tool in the sustainable development in rural areas. So before we finally close that session, please uh, remark, um, we are using this new format now, virtual um, webinars, or um, also we have the opportunity to do virtual brown bag lunches. And if you are in your project interested to share your experiences in the field of rural development with a focus 
on Youth with Us, please contact myself, contact our team. Frank, do you want to add something? It was very interesting to see how startup promotion can work, but also how difficult it is not to really come down to, to the ideas, to the viable business ideas. And I think this is definitely something we need to do more. But I think also, on the other hand, we also see that this can only be part of the solution and that we also need the scalable models you know, on a broad-based value chain development approach. And I think then also startup promotion is much easier, but without this, this basis, this dynamic sectors, I think everything will be quite challenging. You know?